Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why bad things happen if God is good. And let me just begin this way. You know, there was a young couple in a small house, and uh, they decided to go to a movie in the middle of the day. And so they got in their car, and they drove off. And little did they know, there was a man watching from behind a bush. So this man runs around to the back of the house and breaks the window, and he starts to crawl into the kitchen area. And at that point, he hears a voice from a parrot saying, I see you, and Jesus sees you. Well, he wasn't too concerned about that. He wasn't worried about it, so he continued to break in. He's about half the way in, and he hears that voice again. I see you, and Jesus sees you. Well, he keeps on breaking in, and by now he's all the way in the kitchen, and he stands up, and he brushes all the glass off himself, and he hears that voice again. I see you, and Jesus sees you. Attack, Jesus. And this Doberman pincher named Jesus... Bites him in the you-know-what, and he dies out the window, and nobody's ever heard from him again. Now, in this case, something bad happened to a bad person. Now, you know, it would make a lot of sense to me if bad things happen to bad people, but good things happen to good people. That's the kind of thing that would make sense to me. But what we've got in our world today is that bad things not only happen to bad people, but bad things happen to good people, too. You know, that's, that's you and me, that's, that's Christians, that's people who are committed to God. So bad things are a universal occurrence. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an illustration of this, well, here's a young boy, and he was just running throughout the house with a fork in his hand, and look what happened. That's right, this is a real emergency room photograph. Now today he's a much wiser little boy, and he has the battle scars to prove it. You know, if you had two elderly gentlemen in their 70s, and they're driving down the road just humming along to some, you know, nice, easy listening music, not paying too much attention, and they're coming to a pay booth, you know, they've got to slow down. One of them's got to give way to the other car, but they're oblivious, and bad things can happen to good people. Bad things can certainly happen to forest rangers. Why, here's a forest ranger letting a bear out of a portable cage, and all of a sudden, hmm, look at that. That big bear is coming after him on that portable cage. And you know what? He's not giving up. That bear goes around to the front and starts to pull that cage off the truck. And then look at this. The whole thing comes off the back of the truck. Now at this point, the other forest ranger puts down the camera and picks up the <laughs> tranquilizer gun and puts the bear to sleep. And today, we have two much wiser forest rangers. See, So bad things can happen to good people. Bad things can happen to little kids. Yeah, off the coast of Florida, they get too near one of those speedboats. Why, look what can happen here. Now what I want to know is, what is that cat thinking? It kind of looks like, glory, hallelujah. Well, certainly bad things can happen to cats. Why? Poor little thing, it was just a thirsty little cat, and look what happens. But you know, the worst things of all happen to rodents. Yes, indeed. Well, what a way to go, you know? What a way to go. Well, bad things do happen to good people and good creatures. In fact, evil is not a gate crasher in the arena of our lives, but rather it seems to have a reserved seat there. Wouldn't you agree with me on that? Uh, in Job 5.7, it says, Man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. And in Job 14, we read, Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. You know, I think I would get depressed pretty quick if I recited that out loud every morning I got up. You know, man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But, you know, life is tough. I'm sure that all of us here have gone through some tough times, and bad things do happen to good people. My friend Lee Strobel asked George Barna to do a poll, and the question that was asked of the American public was, if you had the chance, what one question would you like to ask God? And by an overwhelming margin, the question was, why is there so much suffering in the world today? So people want to know the answer to that. Now, certainly we asked that question of our professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, and uh, Professor Howard Hendricks said, one of your problems as young theologians is trying to unscrew the inscrutable. I think he's right. We can't understand everything that 
pertains to this issue, at least not on this side of eternity. We've got a lot of questions that we want to ask God, but we can get enough from God's word that we can understand a good biblical theistic worldview on the subject of evil. You know, in Isaiah 55, it says, and this is God speaking, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, we've got to get used to that. We've got to get used to the fact that God knows what he's doing. Now, I have a tendency not only to pray for things, but to tell God how to do it. You see, we can't do that. God is a sovereign God, and he knows best. Just like my little children would come to me, and they would ask for things, sometimes I know it's best to say no, or sometimes I know something that's better for them. Our Heavenly Father is the same with us. Sometimes we may ask for things that are not good for us. You know, Chuck Swindoll is about three miles down the road from me. I often see him down at the uh, Scotty P's Burgers, as well as a local delicatessen down there. And Chuck says that he's got a lot of questions about evil. And he doesn't understand why a lot of things happen to some of the people in his congregation. But he also says that he's learned to trust in God's sovereignty. That no matter what hits, he trusts in God's sovereignty, that God knows what he's doing. And I think that that's something that uh, by the time we're finished today, once this hour is up, I think that you're going to feel that way too. That we're going to learn to trust in God's sovereignty until we enter into the heavenly state. Now what I want to do today is to first give some inadequate solutions to the problem of evil. I want to show you how some different people are handling this issue out there. And then I want to focus on a Christian viewpoint. Now in terms of the inadequate views, there's one view that says God is good but not all powerful. He wants good things to happen, but he's not strong enough to do it. Another view is we create our own realities, both good and bad. Others say evil is just an illusion. It's not real. Other people say that reincarnation accounts for everything. So let's just dive in and talk a little bit about this. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I want you to understand how people are struggling out there. A lot of people are struggling on how to make sense of the evil in our world. Now certainly there are more than four inadequate views. So I'm gonna give you four representative views. And the first is, is that God is good, but not all powerful. And this is a view that was held by Rabbi Kushner. And Kushner wrote a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That's a great title, by the way. That's a great title of a book. And unfortunately, this good title is filled with bad information because the book itself, uh, despite the fact that I'm sympathetic to Rabbi Kushner because he lost his son, he died prematurely. But despite that fact, he came up with a bad solution to the problem of evil. You see, he concluded that God is all good and he wants good things to happen, but he's just not strong enough to make it happen. In fact, let me just give you a quote. He says this, I believe that I was following God's way and doing his work. How could this be happening to my family? If God existed, if he, if he was minimally fair, let alone loving and forgiving, how could he do this to me? And even if I could persuade myself that I deserve this punishment for some sin of neglect or pride that I was not aware of, on what grounds did my son Aaron have to die? Well, I'm sympathetic with that. You know, there's no greater pain than the pain of losing your child. You know, that's, that's just the worst kind of pain imaginable. But unfortunately, he gravitated toward a view that is just simply unbiblical. His conclusion is this. God wants the righteous to live peaceful, happy lives, but sometimes even he can't bring that about. It is too difficult even for God to keep cruelty and chaos from claiming their innocent victims. I don't think that kind of God is worthy of worship. You know, when we worship God, we lift our hands in praise to God because of his infinite perfections, amen? But his God is not infinite in perfections. That's not a God worthy of worship. It's not a God worthy of trust. You know, when things go wrong in my life, I want to be able to pray to God and ask God, who is all-powerful, to bring his power into my situation, whether it's a healing or whether it's some kind of a relational problem or something else. I want an all-powerful God who can take care of me. But just imagine praying to a God that is not all-powerful. It's like, oh, God, I, I hope you can help me. I'm just not sure you're strong enough to do what I need you to do. Are you strong enough? I really need your help, but I think you might be too weak to do what I need you to do. 
You know, I just couldn't trust that kind of a God. That kind of a God is not worthy of trust, nor is there any uh, guarantee that God will defeat evil in the world. I mean, just think about the Muslim terrorists, for example. Is he strong enough to stop them from doing their thing? They want global dominion. Is it possible that a weak God would not be strong enough to carry this out and to, and to stop it? You see, these are the kind of concerns I have when I hear this stuff. Now, of course, the biblical view is that God is all-powerful. In fact, God is called almighty 60 times in the Bible. God has incomparably great power. In fact, if you read the first five books of the Bible, starting with Genesis, one of the primary theological emphases is that God is incomparable, especially compared to the weak gods of Egypt. God is incomparable. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, that's the kind of God I can pray to, amen? That's the kind of God that can answer our prayers and, and uh, take control of our world. Now, there is a highly relevant point from R.C. Sproul on this issue. Sproul said, uh, you know, he was asked, why do bad things happen to good people? And he responded, I haven't met any good people yet, so I don't know. <laughs> well, no, that's a good point. You see, it is a funny statement. But his point was that we're all fallen in sin. Certainly, we can do some good things to people. I can do good things to my children. I can do good things to my wife. But we're so infected by sin that it's affected everything about us, our mind, emotions, and will, and everything else. And so if you want to talk about what causes problems, if you want to talk about what causes evil, this is part of it. You know, the fact that we are fallen in sin. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Secondly, though, here's another inadequate view. We create our own realities. I'm sure you've heard of this idea. We create our own realities by the power of our mind. For example, in the New Thought Movement, uh, Phineas P. Quimby was a guy who said that health, success, and abundant life can be brought about as a result of the thoughts that we think. If you think good, positive thoughts, you can bring about a positive reality. If you think negatively, you're going to bring about bad circumstances. Now, has anybody ever read The Secrets in this room? One, there's a couple of you. I need to take your names down. Let's see. <laughs> We're going to chat with you after the service. I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, that book was largely based on the New Thought Movement because the New Thought Movement teaches what's called the Law of Attraction. The Law of Attraction says that positive attracts positive and negative attracts negative. If you think positively, why, wow, you could have a Mercedes Benz. If you think negatively, you might get a little Volkswagen or something, or maybe nothing at all. You might have to ride a bike. Uh, the thing is, though, is that no matter what the state of your life is today, it's all because of your thoughts that you've thought in the past. So if you look at your life today and you don't like it, if you're living in poverty, it's your own fault because you've been thinking some bad thoughts. Negative thoughts attract dismal circumstances and positive thoughts attract desirable circumstances. Your thoughts can be creative or destructive. And what the New Thought religion does is it teaches people how to think right. Now, The Secret, that book, basically plagiarized from the New Thought movement, point by point. Even though the information in The Secret is presented as a new revelation, it's actually plagiarized from the New Thought movement. Now, there's also the word faith movement. Hope I don't step on any toes here, but uh, this is certainly uh, very similar. In fact, there is historical evidence that much of the word faith movement has strong roots in the New Thought movement that we just talked about. I'm talking about people like Kenneth Copeland, who basically holds to positive confession that there is inherent power, not only in your thoughts, but in your words. If you have good thoughts and confess good thoughts verbally, you will bring about good circumstances. For example, you can tell your wallet to get fat. If you tell your wallet to get fat, then you're going to get rich. That's positive confession. But there's also something called negative confession. That's where you can bring about negative circumstances through negative confessions. Let me give you a real example from Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland says that if you're at a party, for example, and everybody's laughing and having fun and telling stories about what they've been through. And somebody just says, why, I could just die. You know, don't want to say that. Because you could drop dead right on the spot. See, that's a negative confession. So this is the word faith movement. 
It's the idea that good thoughts and good words can bring forth a positive reality, whereas negative words and negative thoughts can bring about a negative reality. Same thing is true with Kenneth Hagin, who is basically the father of the word faith movement. And he says that these are immutable spiritual laws. In other words, it's guaranteed. If you do it right, you will get results. If you have positive confessions, then you will have positive results. That's a promise, he believes. Now, of course, this is an unbiblical idea, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Anybody here familiar with the New Age movement? A show of hands. Okay, some of you are good. We also see this in the New Age. Um, I do a lot of research in the New Age. It's one of my specialties. And I went up to the Bodhi Tree bookstore up in West Hollywood. It's one of the biggest New Age bookstores in the country. And I went up to the bookstore manager and I asked him, what's your biggest selling book? And here it is. It's called Empowerment, The Art of Creating Your Life as You Want It. And so, of course, I bought it. I buy lots of weird books. I read lots of weird books. In fact, my wife, Carrie, makes me keep all of my weird books, thousands of them, in one room in our house. I think she thinks they're levitating in there, kind of floating around. Now, that's where our guest bed is. So, if you come to visit us, guess where you're going to stay? That's right. Maybe that explains the pancake eyes of, of some of the people who have visited us through the years. Anyway, this book is basically the same type thing. Let me just tell you what they say. We make and shape our character and the conditions of our life by what we think. What you think and believe will manifest in your life. By becoming adept at intelligently directing your thought, you can become adept at creating the life that you want. You can take charge of your destiny. So again, your thoughts create your reality. Now here's the big problem with that, okay? There's no ethical accountability. You can't blame those terrorists that flew into the Twin Towers because the people in the Twin Towers collectively had negative thoughts which brought about that attack. The people in the Twin Towers are to blame. They are responsible. They had negative thoughts which caused the terrorists to fly into the buildings. Same thing, you can't blame Adolf Hitler for killing millions of Jews. You can't do it because you see the Jews collectively brought that about by their collective negative thoughts. They created their own reality. This is not a workable worldview. They even go so far as to say that you should not feel sorry for victims because they chose that reality. They brought about that reality. You see, this is an outrageous viewpoint. But as you've seen, it's popular not just among cultic groups, but it's even made its way inside the Christian church, at least in certain segments of the Christian church today. Now there's a third view. This is the wackiest of all, in fact. It's the view that says evil is an illusion. By the way, anybody hold to that view in here today? Okay, Good, nobody, very good. Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of Christian Science, and she basically says that evil is an illusion. Now, here's the way she's thinking. She thinks everything in the universe is God. Everything is God. Now, death cannot be a part of God. Sin cannot be part of God. Pain cannot be a part of God. In fact, nothing negative can be a part of God. Now, since everything is God, that means that you are God. And if you are God, that means that there cannot be sin or evil or sickness and death in you. It is just an illusion. Now here's my problem with that. If all is God, then where did this illusion come from? Inquiring minds want to know. Put another way, if God is perfect, and if all is God, then where did this imperfect idea, this illusion, come from? You see, it doesn't make good sense, does it? You know, thinking people look at this and say, this is not credible. This is not a realistic viewpoint. And then there's the reality check. Mary Baker Eddy died. <laughs> I mean, I don't rejoice in that. I honestly don't. But I mean, it does give lie to her belief system. And she also took morphine regularly for the last four years of her life because she was in severe pain. You know, it, it's not a workable worldview. It's not a credible worldview. I always like to ask Christian scientists a number of questions. Do you lock the front door at night? 
If you do, why? I mean, isn't evil an illusion? Do you leave your keys in the car when you're parked downtown? If they say yes, I ask them why they do it. I mean, isn't evil an illusion? Do you buckle your seat belts? Why? Evil and pain and stuff like that, that's all an illusion, right? Do you go to the dentist when your tooth hurts? Well, they start to squirm at this point, just a little bit. And uh, the point that I'm making is, is not to throw something in their face or to be unkind. The point that I'm trying to make with these people is that this is a worldview that does not work. It is not a workable worldview. You know, do you put life vests on your children when they go out in the ocean? Do you warn your children about getting too close to the grill when the hamburgers are cooking? And what about laws against pedophiles? Do you support those laws? If you say yes, you have to ask why. Isn't evil an illusion? See, the point is, is that these solutions that we're talking about right now are not workable worldviews. They have so many problems that there's no way a thinking person could really subscribe to them. Now, there is a fourth view, very quickly, that says that reincarnation explains evil. This involves the idea of continual birth, and it's based on the law of karma. The law of karma says this. If you do good things in this life, you will get good karma, and that good karma will make sure that you have a better next life. If you do bad things in this life, you're going to get bad karma, which means that in your next life, things are going to be worse off for you. That's the law of karma. It's life by life by life, based upon either good karma or bad karma. And so Gary Zukov says, he's one of these new age types, he says, the strongest support of reincarnation is its happy solution of the problem of moral inequality and injustice and evil, which otherwise overwhelms us as we survey the world. So if a young child dies, that's karma. If a young child gets run over by a car, it's a good thing, because that karma is healing his soul. In fact, here's a picture of Gary Zukov. He wrote a book called The Seed of the Soul, and yes, yours truly read that book. You know, the book got oprah eyes. Do you know what I mean by that? It got promoted by Oprah Winfrey. And for that reason, it became a very big seller. Now, I actually wrote or read the book before it got oprah eyes, And I tried to warn people about it. But after it got oprah eyes, I mean, it was like a tidal wave of error. Anyway, he says, we must not presume to judge when people suffer cruelly, for we do not know what is being healed by karma in these sufferings. So no matter what person you see suffering, it's a good thing, because that's bad karma bringing healing to their soul. They'll be born better in the next life as a result of this bad karma burning out the bad stuff in this life. So if I see a little boy with leukemia, for example, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, because that's bad karma uh, working out the bad stuff in that person's life. I, I just can't see it. There's a number of problems here. Number one. Why is one punished for something you can't remember doing? You know, inquiring minds want to know. And where is the justice in this line of thought? You know, as you look at humanity, does it seem to you that humanity, generation by generation, is getting better and better morally? Does it seem that way to you? It doesn't seem that way to me. I do think that we're making great progress in technology and stuff like that. But it seems like with every new discovery of technology, we find new ways to pervert that technology to exploit our evil ever more. But you would think that if the law of karma worked, humanity would be getting better and better. But that's not happening. Also, this viewpoint makes people passive towards suffering people. For example, if I see somebody suffering from a severe burn, I shouldn't help them at all. Because if I interfere with their bad karma, they're just going to get more bad karma. If I interfere with their bad karma by helping them, not only will they get more bad karma, but I will get bad karma too. So I need to let bad karma do its thing in that person's life and not help them. This makes you passive towards helping other people. So this is really quite abominable when you think about it. And furthermore, most abominable of all, does human cruelty really heal souls? I read about some radical Muslims who went into an enemy territory and they saw there was a pregnant woman almost at term and they shot her right in the womb, killing her and her unborn baby. You're going to tell me that this is bringing healing to her and it's bringing healing to her unborn baby? I can't buy it for a second. 
This is a satanic idea. This is a devastating idea. And yet there are multitudes of people deceived by this teaching on reincarnation. Not only that, but it's a conflicting worldview when you think about it. You see, these people say that everything is God. Everything. The chair you're sitting in is God. This microphone is God. This Mac computer is God. You see, everything is God. But they also teach that there are individual souls that keep on getting reincarnated. You know, it's one or the other. If everything is God, you can't have individual souls. If you've got individual souls, you can't have everything being God. This is a conflicting worldview. And then finally, it all becomes moot when you consider the fact that the Bible completely annihilates reincarnation. In fact, in Hebrews 9.27, we are told that we live once, die once, and then face the judgment. There are no second chances. None. People decide their eternal destiny in one lifetime, and that's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, now is the day of salvation. Now what I want to do is to give you nine points on a Christian assessment. Now we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on any of these nine. Some are longer than others. Now as we begin, I do insist that we take a biblical approach. Is that okay with you? I love the Bible. In fact, my ministry is called Reasoning from the Scriptures. I love the Bible. I believe the Bible has the answers, but we must take a biblical approach on all of this. Kind of a reminder of that little second grade girl who came home from the Sunday school one day, and she was so excited about what she learned in Sunday school. And so her daddy said to her, well, what did you learn in Sunday school? And so the little girl said, oh, dad, it's so cool because, you see, God created Adam first, and then God saw that it was not good for Adam to be alone. So God put Adam to sleep and took out his brains and made a woman of them. <laughs> and all the women said? <laughs> and all the men said? <laughs> no, that's not in the Bible. That's in Second Illusions. Yeah. We need to be biblical. That's a funny story, but it does illustrate a very important point. And that is, you know, there's a lot of strange views out there. We want to make sure that we're focusing on a biblical view because the Bible comes from God. And ideally, I'd love to spend time talking about why we can trust God's word before even dealing with this issue. But I want you to just take it for granted. There's information on the back tables back there that can help you understand more about that. So let's hop into it. Here's the big problem. God is all good. God is all powerful. And yet evil exists. How can all these things be true at the same time? Well, let's look at it. First of all, let's ask what is evil. This is what's going to help us to understand this issue. Evil doesn't exist in itself, but rather evil is a corruption of something good. Here you see a bridge. This bridge used to be a good bridge made of good wood. You could walk across this bridge to the other side. But after about uh, two decades or so, this has become a bad bridge. This bridge has become corrupt. This is evil. That's an example of what is evil. It's a corruption of something good. Tree rot involves the corruption of a good tree. Tooth decay involves the corruption of a good tooth. Do I hear an amen on that? We all know what a toothache is like. That is evil. Lung cancer involves the corruption of a good lung. Blindness involves the corruption of a good eye. Deafness involves the corruption of a good ear. All of these illustrate evil. Evil is the corruption of something that is good. Now, it might help you for me to give a, a more broad illustration. I want you to consider Bill Gates' estate. Uh, you can see it up on the screen. Now, I don't know if you can tell it, but his giant complex, compared to the other houses in the neighborhood, I mean, it's really big. And I must tell you that from, pers from the point of perspective, those other houses surrounding his house are actually quite large houses. It's a very expensive part of the land, if I might put it that way. So his house is absolutely huge. He hired the best architect in the country, charged an outrageous amount of money for it. He had the best materials from around the world brought in. We're talking about uh, you know, Germany and France and England, just the best materials from all over. It's completely computerized. I mean, he can just talk things and you know, speak things and things start to happen inside this house unless Windows crashes, of course, in which case he has to restart his house. <laughs> 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 
That would be kind of funny, wouldn't it, to have, have a whole house crash at once? But in any event, let's say that after 10 years or so, there's a massive termite invasion into that house. Well, here's the question I want to ask you. Would termites in Bill Gates' house disprove the existence of an architect? No. It just means that what was good has now become corrupted. Likewise, if vandalism happens in Bill Gates' house, does that mean that there is no architect? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that what was good has now become corrupted. Likewise, if the purposeful burning of Bill Gates' house occurs, does that mean there is no architect? No, it doesn't mean that. It just simply means that what was created good has now become corrupt. Would the outbreak of weeds in Bill Gates' lawn disprove the existence of an architect? Well, I'm kind of getting monotonous here, I know that, but I'm, I'm making a very important philosophical point. And that's where these illustrations help. No, of course not. This does not disprove the existence of an architect. Now, what if Bill Gates is a real slob and he's got garbage everywhere? Would that disprove the existence of an architect? No. It just means that what was created good has now become corrupt in some way. Now, can you tell I'm building up to make a big point? Yeah, I am. You see, here's planet Earth. You see, evil on Earth does not disprove a divine architect. It just means that God's original good creation has become corrupted. That's the point that I'm making to you. Now, the question that flies up at this point is, how did the good get corrupted on earth? What happened between then and now to bring about the present corruption of planet earth? Well, that's what we want to talk about. And that brings me to my second point, the role of free will, the role of free will. You know, I believe personally that the wrong use of free will broke our world. The original creation was very good. You remember in the Genesis account when God created everything and he looked out over the expanse? What did God say? It is good. It is very, very good. But today there is pain and sin and evil and suffering and death. So what happened between then and now to bring about this situation? Well, we know from scripture that Adam and Eve used their free wills to choose the wrong. And prior to that, who used their free will to do the wrong? It was Lucifer. Lucifer used his free will along with some other angels that followed him, and they rebelled against God. And all of this is when evil and pain and suffering and death entered into our universe. This is when it began. And my friends, free will is a good thing. Amen? Free will is a good thing. Free will enables us to choose to love God. Free will enables me to choose to love my wife and my children and all of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Free will is good. Free will enables us to choose to bless people. Free will enables us to choose to engage in virtuous acts and to be self-sacrificial. Free will enables us to choose to give our money to worthy causes. Free will enables us to choose to show mercy on people, especially if they don't deserve it. Free will enables us to choose to give our lives in saving another person. You see, free will is good. It's a wonderful gift that God has given us. The problem is that free will necessarily involves the possibility of wrong choices. Now, you see this baby on the screen? This is a, a, a picture that someone sent me of a baby just before the baby pushed food off the table onto the floor. Now, can, can you tell that this baby is giving serious thought to engaging in this sinful act? He's thinking to himself, Mama doesn't want me to push that plate on the ground, but I think it might be really fun to push that plate on the ground. I think I'm going to push that plate on the ground, and then he does it. You see, it starts early. It starts early, making free will decisions that are wrong and bring about the wrong thing. Uh, free will necessarily involves the possibility of wrong choices. Now, some people ask, why didn't God create humans without the capacity for evil? Well, if God did that, there would be no freely expressed love. I couldn't choose to love God, but I would rather only act in programmed ways, kind of like a robot, or kind of like one of those little chatty dolls where you have to pull the string on its back and it says something. Now I just want you to imagine with me, what if God created millions of little chatty dolls to be with him in heaven? You know, God pulls one string and it says, 
we love you, Lord God. Then he pulls another string on another doll and it says, we exalt you, O Yahweh. And then God pulls another string. The doll says, we bow down before you, O great one. You see, that wouldn't bring glory to God. What would bring glory to God? Well, what would bring glory to God is free will creatures who choose voluntarily to say, thy will be done forever and ever. You see, that is a situation that would bring glory to God. But if God had created automatons like robots or little chatty dolls, it simply would not be possible. And by the way, that's a trick picture up there with the chatty doll. Chatty dolls can't pull their own strings. I hope you notice that, okay? Now today, some of our suffering is due to our own wrong use of free will, and some of our suffering is due to other people's wrong use of free will. If I might, just consider George and his choice to smoke. I must confess to you, I used to smoke, yeah, back in high school. I smoked for one week. Yeah. You see, what happened was, it was snowy, and I was standing there in the snow one day, smoking my cigarette, looking super cool. You know, teenage boys, they want to look impressive to teenage girls. That's the whole truth of the matter right there. I'm looking super cool as, as some girls are passing by, and I took a step, and I slipped in the snow. And when I slipped in the snow, my back hit the embankment of snow, at which point my mouth flew open. That cigarette hit the back of my throat, and I gagged. I swallowed. I never smoked again. In fact, I'm thinking of writing a book, How I Stopped Smoking in One Day. <laughs> it was foul, absolutely foul for the next three days, that indigestion. In any event, consider George and his choice to smoke. It not only affects him in terms of possible lung cancer, but his family members could get lung cancer too. Secondhand smoke. Uh, he might fall asleep at night and that cigarette touches the bed, the whole thing goes up in flames and burns his whole house down, killing everybody. And then the flames jump to the next houses and burn those houses down to the ground. Somebody in the neighborhood might have asthma and get rushed to the hospital because they can't breathe. On and on it goes. But George is just one man. Multiply George times billions of people. You understand now where evil comes from, right? You got billions of people making wrong choices. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of wrong things taking place on planet Earth. Now, I need to tell you that God is not responsible for man's wrong choices. And I think nobody has said this better than our friend Norman Geisler, who has written a book on evil as well. He says, whereas God created the fact of freedom, humans perform the acts of freedom. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. You know what I think one of the biggest manifestations of sin is in our world today? It's the blame game. We like to pass the buck. We like to say somebody else did. Not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. That's a key manifestation of sin. And people love to blame God for stuff. But God is not to blame. Whereas God created the fact of freedom, humans perform the acts of freedom. I want you to consider Henry Ford as an example. Now, he created a really good car. It's called the Model T. Now, I wasn't there back then, but I understand it was a really good car. I'll have to ask Norm Geisler about that. I think it probably is. <laughs> okay, just making sure you're awake. That's good. The fact is, though, what if a drunk decided to get into that car and drive down the street and crash into a house and injure people? Are we going to say that Henry Ford is a bad man? No. What Henry Ford did was good. He created a good car. The person to blame is the person who got drunk and drove down the street and abused what was there. See, he took what was good and corrupted the good. That's what evil is. So we cannot blame God. God is not at fault here. Now number three, God will deal with evil according to his own perfect timing. This is a very important point. There are some people that say that God should abolish all evil immediately. I want you to think about that viewpoint. God abolishing all evil immediately, right now. You know what the problem with that viewpoint is? It's got fatal implications for you and me. You know, if God got rid of all evil at midnight tonight, I wouldn't be here. Norman Geisler would not be here. Your pastor would not be here. Of course, all of that's a moot point because none of you would be here either. <laughs> none of us would be here. This would be a peopleless universe. 
So personally, I'm glad God is being patient before he finally overcomes all evil in the world. Let's remember, God is not finished yet. I always tell people, stay tuned for the second coming. You know, stay tuned for the judgment. In that day, nobody will be able to say that God has not dealt effectively with the problem of evil. God's timing is not human timing. That God has not defeated evil today does not mean he won't defeat it in the future. And God actually may have reasons that you don't know about for allowing evil to continue today. You know, for one thing, I think that God is being patient because he wants as many people as possible to become believers on this planet. I want you to look at 2 Peter 3.9. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God is allowing time for people to repent. Number four, God can bring about a greater good out of suffering. You know, it happened with Joseph, didn't it? You know, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, and he was taken down to Egypt, then he was thrown in jail. Now, from our perspective, that sounds pretty bad. doesn't sound like something Joseph would have enjoyed. But what ended up happening? You see, God used those circumstances to bring Joseph to Egypt, where God exalted Joseph to a position of great authority, where he was able to rescue people from famine. Is that good from evil? Absolutely. God is a master at doing it. The Apostle Paul was often thrown in jail. That doesn't sound fun. But what did Paul do when he was in jail? He wrote a lot of the New Testament. I would say that's a good thing. Paul's been blessing people in every generation as a result of his being in jail, in which he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit some of God's word. And then, of course, Jesus, when he died on the cross. You know, a passerby might look up on the, on the cross and see that cruel crucifixion and say, can anything good come of that? But you know, what has come of it is salvation. Christ died for us. He took your place and my place on the cross. And because of what Jesus did, I can be saved. That's bringing good out of evil. A uh, modern example might be Johnny Erickson Tata, who is a great, great woman. I've actually uh, been with her. She is a woman who probably would not have become famous if it were not for her disability as a quadriplegic. You see, as a result of her suffering, God elevated her to worldwide fame with a worldwide ministry, and she has blessed countless people. That's bringing good out of evil. But there's other examples. Sometimes God brings about the greater good of increased faith. You know, faith is like a muscle. You got to keep on working that muscle to get that muscle in shape. That's why people go to the gym. They go to the gym to make sure those muscles get stronger and stronger and stronger. Well, God does the same thing with us. When we go through adversity, God uses those circumstances to build up those faith muscles so that when new adversities come down the pike, we're better equipped to deal with them. So that's a greater good. There's also the greater good of saving faith. When I'm talking about saving faith, I'm talking about turning to the Lord in the midst of troubling times. Do you know what the missionaries tell us? The missionaries tell us that Christianity is growing fastest in those parts of the world where the suffering is the greatest. You begin to wonder if people would really turn to the Lord if nothing was wrong. You see, evil causes people to recognize that something is wrong, and they're crying out for something more, and that something more is salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? So God brings about the greater good of saving faith. God also brings about the greater good of changed lives. You know, I think about the moth who has to struggle to get out of the cocoon. And as that moth struggles back and forth to get out of the cocoon, do I look like a moth, by the way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Struggling, it pushes liquids into the wings. And by the time that moth gets out of the cocoon, the wings are full enough of liquid that they are vibrant and alive, and he can now fly. But if somebody comes along and snips open that cocoon so that he doesn't have to struggle, the wings won't work. And the moth dies. You see, in this case, the struggle turns out to be a good thing. It can change lives. By analogy, same thing is true of you and me. God uses suffering to bring about change lives. You must keep in mind that God's chief end for us is holiness, not happiness. God cares more for our character than our comfort. Our greatest good is Christ-likeness, not freedom from pain. 
and never ever forget that God is working from and for eternity. There's also the greater good of avoiding greater evil. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? The greater good of avoiding greater evil. What I'm talking about, for example, is if you get a toothache, that's bad, but that toothache can actually help you avoid a greater evil of an, ins an infection that could spread to your entire body. You know, there have been some historians that have talked about some of the pharaohs who, uh, you know, some have su suggested, maybe one of them got an abscessed tooth and died from a massive infection that invaded the whole body because it was not treated. You see, a toothache warns you that something needs to be done about your tooth. A burning pain warns us to remove our hand from that hot pan. Uh, chest pains warns us that our heart needs immediate medical attention. So some pain can be good because it can help us to avoid a greater evil. Number five, God hinders the growth of evil at the present. I won't spend much time here, but it's sufficient to say that God is not letting evil just run amok out there. He is setting boundaries. And those boundaries come, for example, from the Holy Spirit who restrains evil. God has created a human government that has the power of the sword, the power to lock up criminals. God has given us the church, which not only has its ministry of evangelism, but also discipling people so that they become more Christ-like. That fights the evil in our world. There is the family unit, which Martin Luther called the school of character. I must tell you, I think the family unit is suffering today. It really, really is. But uh, you know, regardless of that, among Christian groups like this, the family unit is a school of character where we pass on values to our children. And so that battles against evil as well. And of course, God's word and the promise of future judgment is also something that stands against the, uh, the, the spread of evil. So the point that I am making to you is that evil cannot run amok. Uh, even though God is permitting evil on earth, there are parameters around that evil. And God says this far, but no further, you see. And then one day, Christ will come again and defeat evil altogether. Number six, one day we'll see the big picture. I love this part. One day we'll see the big picture. Now, each one of us is like a single thread on the tapestry of life. And as a single thread, you might be a red thread or a blue thread or a white thread or a brown thread. Now, if you are a single thread on the tapestry of life, that means that all you can see is the thread next to you. You cannot see the whole tapestry at once. But one day, I believe, when we get to heaven, God is going to pull that camera back so that we can see the entire tapestry at once. And we'll be able to understand, finally, ah, oh, I see how that circumstance caused me to, to do this other thing, which was a good thing. And now I see how this relates to this over here. And I see how this thing that happened with my son or daughter relates to a bigger picture which brought about awesome good. You see, I think that we're going to say, ah, now I can see better. You see, But right now, we're a single thread, and we don't see the big picture. That's why we have to have faith in the present. Number seven, this may not be the best of all possible worlds as we have it right now, but it is the best way to the best possible world. And again, we are indebted to our friend Norman Geisler for this insight. Right now, our world is permeated by evil. Bad things happen to good people. There are diseases, heart disease and cancer and so forth. There are accidents that kill people at a, uh, at a young age even. There are wars that break out where untold thousands are killed. So this is not the best of all possible worlds as we have it right now. But it is the best way to the best possible world. Because in the end, there's going to be a company of believers, including you and me, who will be in heaven forever and ever and ever face to face with the living Messiah, completely free from sin and Satan and death and mourning and pain, and it will be wonderful. I see, it will be wonderful. I love the way C.S. Lewis put it. God in his omniscience saw that from a world of free creatures, even though they fell, he could work out a deeper happiness and a fuller splendor than any world of automata like robots and chatty dolls would admit. So God knows what he's doing. Number eight, very quickly, answering some objections. I don't want to spend much time here. Evil is incompatible with the existence of God. That's what some people will say. Well, here's the answer. How do you know something's evil? 
How do you know something's evil? We would not know what evil is without an infinite moral compass that points moral north. Again, it is C.S. Lewis who said, I can't know what a crooked line is unless I first understand what a straight line is. In other words, I cannot understand unrighteousness unless I first know what righteousness is. I cannot understand what is unholy unless I first understand what is holy. I cannot un not understand what the evil is apart from understanding first what the good is. God is our infinite moral north moral point, infinitely. Without God, we can't even really have a logical discussion about the problem of evil. Objection number two, if God created evil or, or if God created all things, then that means that God created evil too. Well, not so, not so. We've already talked about this. God created all things good. Evil is a corruption of that good by free will creatures. And I might also mention that to blame our good God for man's evil is itself an evil act which we have freely chosen to engage in, you see. And so this is not a good objection. Uh, number three, even so, if God created beings with free will, then he is responsible for the existence of God. Well, again, we've already answered this too. The gift of free will is a good thing. You know, we can freely choose to love one another, to love God. We can freely love to, cho to show mercy. We can freely choose to do virtuous things. You know, free will is a good thing. But man freely chose to pervert this good thing, thereby engaging in the ungood, also known as evil. You see, so man, again, is the culprit. And then finally, God should have dealt with evil by now, some people object. Well, we're not yet at the end of the story. We're not at the end of the divine narrative. Stay tuned for the second coming, and like a good novel, it'll all make good sense at the end of the story. Amen? Now, finally, I close with this. We need a top-down perspective, a top-down perspective. You see, paradise was lost back in the book of Genesis. And when paradise was lost, that's when sin came about. That was when death came about and mourning. That's when bondage to Satan happened. That's when the tree of life was barred from us. But I tell you what, paradise is going to be regained. It's going to be regained. And I wish I had an hour to talk about this part. Fact is, there'll be no more sin, no more death, no more mourning or Satan and the tree of life will be restored to us. And in heaven, as one per person put it, all of our bad things on planet Earth will seem like one bad night in a hotel. So that's what it's gonna be like. But from heaven's perspective, all the stuff we experience on Earth will seem like nothing. Trusting God involves looking beyond what we can see to what God can see. Do you remember the example of the tapestry of life, how you're a single thread in the tapestry of life and your perspective is limited? Trusting God means looking beyond what you can see to what God can see. And if you can do that, I promise you that will revolutionize your attitude as a Christian as you continue to live day by day. Paul was one such person who learned to trust God in that way. Paul said, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. I love that passage. Now I'm going to give you the principle that has helped me for many, many years. It goes like this. When bad things happen to you that you don't understand, that is the most important time to anchor yourself on the things that you do understand. That's so important, I'm going to tell it to you again. When bad things happen to you that you don't understand, that is the most important time to anchor yourselves on the things that you do understand. And the things that we do understand are not just the things that we've talked about today during this hour, but the entire counsel of the Word of God. The more richly saturated your mind is with the Word of God, the easier you'll be able to cope with life when it throws you a punch. Does that make sense to you? When bad things happen to you that you don't understand, that is the most important time to anchor yourself on the things that you do understand. I close with this. Soon we will be in the EFZ. That is to say, soon we will be in the evil free zone. And it will be awesome. Thank you for your attention. God bless you.